So Claire, welcome to Mood Plus Plus. We're very glad to have you and that you continue a little mini series about testing. So thanks a lot for sharing your expertise. Thanks, Klaus. Oh, it's really exciting to be here and uh, what an honor to be invited. Thank you very, very much indeed. Um, so uh, thank you already for that great introduction. Yes, I've been programming C++ for 20 years and, and using Qt as well. But throughout a lot of that time, my focus has been on testing and testability of code. And last year, I uh, decided to make that even more of my focus. And so to set out on a, a path of um, consultancy and training. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. Also, at the end, I'll show you this link at the bottom of the page, this talks link, and, and show you how to find all of the links and references and some extra information as well from this talk. So don't feel you need to be frantically taking notes as we go. And the slides will be available as well. So my goal for this evening is to try and share the power of approval tests with you to give you a sense of when approval test is useful and how you might use it, give you a sense of what it feels like. Um, so it's a fantastic bit of timing this actually. So I really enjoyed the previous MOOC++ talk, which was Dave Steffen from the States talking about empirical unit testing. And uh, this follows on really nicely from that. So, uh, my talk is very much about testing legacy code. And um, so it's sort of a, an add on to Dave's talk. So in situations where what Dave's talked about isn't um, immediately useful for you because the code is not structured in a way to be testable, that's where this talk becomes uh, useful and powerful. So what do I mean by legacy code? Well, the dictionary definition of legacy is money or property that you receive from someone after you die. And I love the observation that anywhere outside of software development, legacy is something is valuable and to be appreciated and to be saved perhaps for the next generation. Less so with software development or many people's attitude to legacy code. In a sense, the actual definition doesn't really matter, but my favourite of the ones listed here is Kate Gregory's, any code that you want to change but are afraid to. So want to change, maybe need to change, maybe you're required to fix a bug or add a feature, but you're not comfortable doing so. That's a lovely definition of legacy code. And so here's the typical scenario. You've inherited some legacy code that's got valuable and you need to change it. So you need to make a change, <clears throat> but you inspect the code and you find there are no tests. So that probably means the code wasn't designed for testing and it means you're going to need to refactor it to add tests. But you hopefully subscribe to the view that refactoring isn't safe without tests. And so you're back at the top of the circle. And this talk and approval tests in general is focused on breaking this particular link on the right hand side. So when you've got no tests and the code wasn't designed for testing, how can you start adding tests so that then you can begin refactoring? So I'm not talking about the mechanics of refactoring here. I'm talking about how to go from no tests to tests and good test coverage when your code that you're working on wasn't designed for that. I make some assumptions in the interest of time that you understand the value of automatically run tests on software, um, that you're comfortable evaluating existing tests and seeing how good they are, though I do talk about that a little bit, and that we're going to suspend all concerns about definitions of tests, whether something is a unit test or integration or whatever. It's, are they automated tests? Will they tell you if someone makes a mistake? So a little bit of background. Um, nearly three years ago, whilst I was um, employed as a C++ developer, but mostly alternating between product owner and scrum master, I saw this tweet from Llewellyn Falco. And I knew Llewellyn was the creator of a library called Approval Tests, but I knew nothing about Approval Tests. And I, I followed Llewellyn on Twitter because of an amazing video that he and Woody Zool um, produced some years ago now on how to refactor code without needing to understand the code at all. 
Uh, so Llewellyn was asking for help expanding his C++ knowledge and porting approval test to Google Test Framework, which I was familiar with. So I stuck my head up above the virtual parapet and said I'd be interested in hearing more. And since then, I've paired many, many times remotely with Llewellyn, learned a lot about testing, about refactoring, about approval tests. And that's um, I want to share some of what I've learned with you in this talk today. So if you haven't seen approval tests before, I love this defi definition of it. It's an approach that allows you to verify a chunk of output, such as a file, in one operation, so one line of code, as opposed to writing lots of individual test assertions for each little bit of the, the content that's being approved. I'm going to be talking about the C++ implementation of approval tests tonight, but the concept, it's, it's uh, implemented in, I forget, 10 or 15 different languages. I've certainly made really good use of the Python implementation um, in recent years. And the concepts and the vocabulary are consistent between the implementations. So if you happen to be working in a different language, but you're interested in approval tests, odds are that you'll find a good implementation in other languages, especially C Sharp and .NET. It's a really, really rich implementation there and um, supporting many of the, the levels of frameworks that, that um, um, in that environment. So I'm going to pause at this point quickly and ask if there are any questions in the Twitch chat so far. Not yet. OK, cool. Thank you very much. So let's look at getting started with approval. So if we go from no uh, approvals code to actually starting to use it, what do we need to do? I'm going to have four demos that I'm going to do this evening. Um, so let's move to Sea Lion and to demo one, hello approvals. And what we're going to do here is we're being asked to run this test and then fix it. So that suggests that it's going to fail. So we're using the catch two test framework. Um, and that says that we've got a test case and I'm calling it hello approvals. And so I will run it and see what happens. So first of all, the code compiled and then Sea Lion is presenting a, a nice IDE to show us the failing tests or show us the, the, um, the results of all of the tests that we've run. Uh, so uh, Catch is telling us that on line eight, which is there, there was a failure. Um, we uh, said that we wanted the result of hello approvals to be a question mark. And the result of hello approvals was actually this string which doesn't equal a question mark. So there's a style of writing tests which consists of write the code first, write a test with nonsense, and then paste the answer in, uh, which is kind of the opposite of test-driven development. But sometimes it's all you can do with existing code that, that you didn't write and that doesn't have tests. And so I... Uh, I did control R as the shortcut to rerun the test, and now it passes. Uh, exit code zero. Um, so that you might use that if you've inherited some code to start exploring the behavior of the code. Uh, maybe you don't even actually save any tests, or, or maybe you do. It's a way to start understanding code. OK, so far, so good. Our next uh, request is to test hello approvals, hello poetry. OK, so let's run that and see what happens. Hmm. OK, so uh, the result of that function, it returns some text and the text, if any Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy fans will recognise the uh, delightful Vogon poetry there. So what I did in the previous test doesn't fit so well now. I mean, I could copy and paste that into the code, but I'd have to deal with indentation, end of line characters, quotes and things like that. May, I may end up duplicating the implementation of the function I'm testing. And that doesn't feel so comfortable. 
And this, we're now we're getting firmly into the territory of approval tests, things that are not easy to test. So I want to show you how to add approval tests to this project. So you can uh, go to our releases page and download the single header of the latest release. Uh, so all of our code is in a single header in the release, not in the development version. Um, at, with a very liberal license, so you'll probably be able to add it to your own version control system if you wanted to. There's also what we call a starter project, which is a tiny project with CMake and uh, Visual Studio Solution files set up. So you can download that and start experimenting with it straight away. And we have a tutorial that you can follow through in that file. If you happen to use Conan, the um, part of our release is each release is to upload the latest version, to add support for the latest version to Conan Center. Uh, so once you've got the single header, you then need to go to your main file. And you are probably familiar with the idea of test frameworks requiring you to add some kind of configuration to set them up. And these two lines, two and three, that I've highlighted, if you've used the catch test framework, you might be familiar, that's the most common way. Approvals test has a similar idea. So you need to include our header. And this is specifically in your main. Before you include the header, you need to communicate to approval test which test framework it's supporting. And to tell it that we want to support, we need it to support catch, catch two. Um, we include this hash define approvals underscore catch. Um, we do that those two lines in one file, typically main.cpp. We don't need any other code there. Um, compiling the file with the main in takes noticeably longer than all of our other files, which is why I uh, just take a few seconds why I've put that in there already. And so then we're going to add the, cat, the approval tests header here. And now we're going to do something really quite different from um, what you will have seen before. So all of our functionality is in the approval tests namespace. And the most common um, class that you'll be using inside that is approvals. And you'll see a bunch of different methods here. And the most commonly used one is verify. So you can think of verify as approval tests vocabulary for check or require or assert, the kind of thing that you see in other test frameworks. And we're going to tell it to verify that function. So I'll comment out the previous code. And we're now going to run this test. Um, so let's see what happens. <clears throat> so two things happen. I'm going to go back to C line and show you that first of all. So the test failed. It's the test on line 14. And it said due to unexpected exception message, failed approval, approval file not found. So it's telling me that we hadn't already created a file whose name is constructed from the name of the source file that we are uh, writing tests in and the name of our test case. And because that failed, it popped up a diffing tool. So it searched on my machine for a diffing tool. And the Raxis Merge was the first one it found. And it's saying, I don't know what the right answer is for this test. You've never told me. So the right answer, the approved file is empty. You might think of approved here as expected, uh, similar vocabulary and other test frameworks. And then on the left hand side is the actual or the received file. And so instead of having to represent this in C++ source code, all this text and worry about indentation, we don't have to worry about any of that. And whenever there's a failing test, approvals, uh, whenever approvals verify fails, it pops up a diffing tool. And if you like the output, you copy from received to approved. And in Araxis Merge, we do that with this little arrow here. So we've said we approve that text. We verified it. That's the right answer. 
And then, of course, we need to save the output. So save second file. And then I will quit Araxis merge. So alongside the source code, we've got our received file, which I've copied over to approved. And now I run the test again. And we haven't changed the source code, so it's really quick to rerun. And so the test passed. It didn't need to rebuild. And because the test passed, it deleted the received file. So that is our first approval test. So approval tests, approvals verify. Um, and if you were wondering why are we not seeing in the source code what the expected answer is, hopefully you can see now that the answer is that the, the right answer is stored in a separate file. And so what we would do, we've got our passing test. And so I would commit that in version control. I'm going to tell it to include the unversioned file as well. Um, and let's say that our test message is test hello approvals. So we, it's important that we test, we commit the approved file with the source code because the approved file is fundamentally part of the test. And then what I've done in, um, uh, in my git ignore for the project is to uh, tell it to ignore the received files. We never want to commit the received files. We only want to commit the approved files. So that is our um, demo of approval tests. So to summarize, approvals verify is going to be the thing that you use most of the time. I passed in a string, but there are other overloads that uh, take in um, a wider, um, more flexible variety of inputs. And I'll talk about the optional options argument later. There's also, if you want to verify the contents of a container, there's verify all. And that writes out one element at a time uh, of the container to a single file so that um, a single test will generate a single file with all the elements of the container written out. And I mentioned about the approval test namespace. So the stages of approval tests are you pass in an object to verify it writes the, the object to a received file, reads the corresponding approved file, and checks if they're the same, ignoring differences in line endings, in Mac, um, Windows, Linux line endings. Uh, if, they, if they're the same, your test passed. If they're different, your test fails, and a reporter, in other words, differencing tool, pops up. So it's easy to add tests quickly, and it's easily easy to visualize the differences. Um, because uh, if the output changed, the differencing tool would only show me the changes. So in, a, in my um, 10, 15 lines of Vogue on poetry, if there was a spelling uh, typo introduced, the differencing tool would just show that one different word. Uh, and if I like, if the output is different and I like it, then I copy the change over from left to right. Uh, so it's easy to update. And I really like the way for testing of complex things that it separates out the um, test data from the test code. Um, and like I said, it ignores uh, end of line differences. Um, single header finds the diff tool automatically, comes up with sensible default naming. It basically just works. These are the test frameworks that it supports out of the box. So catch, two, and doc test, um, Google, and the boost test framework, which is our most recent addition. And Dave Steffen talked last time about the C20 boost.ut library, and we support that as well. So with that, uh, are there any questions? I've been getting beeps in my ear, so I suspect that means yes. yes. So we have a bunch of questions. Okay. So the first one um, is, uh, so I, I just read the questions. Is approval test part of unit test phase itself? Part of unit test phase? Was that? Yeah, so is that... approval test part of the unit test phase itself? 
so approval tests is a layer that sits on top of any test framework that we support. And if you use the test framework we didn't support, it's it, it's easy to add support for new test frameworks and we can help you with that. Uh, so, yes, it listens out. When you call verify, it uh, detects that the test, a test is running um, and gets the name of the test from the test framework. So it, it doesn't care what test framework it's running, but it does need to know which test framework is running. I, if that doesn't under, if that doesn't answer the question, I need a better understanding of the question. Okay, so good so far. Thank you. Um, second question: I'm using Google Test in our project. Is approval test dependent on any particular unit test frameworks? Yes, um, that was probably yeah. asked before I showed this slide. Yeah. It supports all of these. Um, right. Okay, next question. Pretty cool idea of tests. Which approval tests work with catch BDD? So, um, scenario given when then style. So, as I understand it, um, catch given um, given then when given when then it basically uses catch sections and we support catch sections so I only show the name being obtained from uh, the name of the test case but if you um, add section named sections inside um, your test then we pick up that name as well. So yes, it, it should just work. The only caveat is you might end up with very long test names, which might on Windows might make it hard to clone the source code because you might end up blowing out the path length limit or you might have to figure out how to turn off the path length limit. But um, but there, there's, there's nothing to stop it working in that mechanism. All right. Then, uh, how do approval tests differ from what some people refer to as snapshot testing? Okay, that's a brilliant question. It's essentially the same thing. Um, it's also known as characterization testing. Mm -hmm. uh, for a brilliant question, Reid, I should have mentioned that. Thank you for asking. Um, I, I guess another thing, so another thing to say is I know I'm not alone in having invented a homegrown mechanism for this on a large body of code that I worked on many years ago. And really what, and, and many times when I've given this or similar talks, people have said, yeah, we, we actually had something like that that we did ourselves. And what approval tests provides is that this just works out of the box and the integration is such that works really well with multiple test frameworks and the diffing tool support is really good. So it's much more usable and you're building on Lorellin's decade or more experience of using this in many different organizations and learning how to apply it effectively. So different name for the same kind of thing, but much more powerful implementation than most people end up with by default. All right. So, okay, there's two more. Mm -hmm. Let me should uh, continue. Uh, I really like the idea. How does the rights received part work? Can I just overload the uh, OStream oper so output operator for custom data types? Yes, you can. And um, for a long time that you had to do that with custom data types. I'll mention later on other ways of implementing that if you don't want to out, um, override that, that operator. Um, but doing that will certainly work. Okay, and perhaps the next question fits to this pretty well. Do the objects to be verified have to provide some sort of serialization? No, the objects don't have to provide some sort of serialization, but something has to if it's not a string. And um, yes, I I'll talk about that uh, as well later. All right. Thank you. OK, thank you. So uh, obviously these are fairly contrived examples, um, but what I hope you can see from them is uh, start to get ideas of how you might apply them and spot situations where you might be able to apply them yourselves. And so with that, I'm going to move on to uh, an exercise called Gilded Rose. So let me close all of these files, switch to Gilded Rose. And for this, uh, let me actually clear the results of a previous run. OK, so let's look at the tests in Gilded Rose. OK, so we've got an approval tests file provided already. 
Uh, but everything's commented out. OK, but we have got an instruction. Measure the line coverage in gildedrose.cc. That is achieved in the gilded rose test. So here's gildedrose.cc. So um, uh, Barney Della gave a talk um, talking about gilded, the gilded rose carter or practice exercise at the recent C++ on C talk. Uh, he went into a lot more detail and gave a lot of good tips and tips and tricks for testing. I'm only going to scratch the surface of it here. This is an exercise popularised by Emily Bache. And the idea is you've got some legacy code. Um, what you want to test is you've got a class called Gilded Rose and we want to test its update quality method. And Gilded Rose stores a container of items. Uh, it doesn't matter the details of this, but an item is constructed from a name, an integer selling value and an integer quality value. So it's reasonable to assume that the update quality method updates the quality. And um, if we look at the initial test that we were provided with, um, we have got, again, this is catch two. We've got a very simple check that <clears throat> constructs a gilded rose with this uh, one set of values, cause update quality, and all it does is test that the name is unchanged. So it's not testing the quality at all. And then we have a second test that does a similar thing with different values and checks all three results at the end. So in our definition of approval tests, where we said, as opposed to test lots of individual asserts, here's an example of individual asserts. And we're being asked to find out what code coverage we get with these existing tests. And so for that, I'm going to have to turn on measurement of code coverage in my build. And I've done that with an option here to turn on or off. And if code coverage is on, then I include a CMake file called codecoverage.cmake, which is from Lars Bilke. Apologies if I got that pronunciation wrong. There's, um, I've got uh, links to all of this to show how to set this up, which I can show you later. OK, so CMake will have run and regenerated all my configuration files now, my build files. And so we've got uh, Gilded Rose Exercise 2 selected. And I'm not going to just run it. I'm not going to debug it. I'm going to run it and collect code coverage data. Uh, so um, that was quick. And what happens? OK, we now see that Sea Lion has displayed percentages here. And the file we're interested in, it said 51% of the lines in this file were covered. And uh, Sea Lion is showing lines that we've executed in green, uh, ones we haven't in red. I've made these colours more vivid for the purpose of the recording. They're not quite so in your face by default. So our tests don't go, don't cover any of these lines in red. An important caveat here is just because the green lines have been executed doesn't mean to say their values have been tested. But we know for sure that the red lines, none of this behaviour has been tested. So 51% is our answer to our first question. And then use approval tests to get to 100% line coverage of that gilded rose.cc. And try to do better than verifying an individual item or verifying a collection of items. And this was too much code to type in a live demo and subject you to me watching to, to watching me type all of this. So I'm going to talk it through. I'm going to talk it through from the middle and work outwards. So where you've seen approvals verify before, now we're using combination approvals, verify all combinations. Wow, I've never seen that message before. I'm going to ignore it. Uh, maybe I can't ignore it. Um, uh, so verify all combinations. 
And that is, if you've heard of Cartesian products, um, then that's a shortcut to tell you what's going to happen. If you haven't, don't worry, I'll explain it. And we're passing in three containers. We're passing in a container of names, a container of selling values, whatever that int means, and a container of quality values. And verify all combinations takes iterates over each of the values in a big loop effectively uh, or nested loops for all three in this case um, and it calls whatever it needs a lambda or a function to call and you can see where it's this lambda is receiving one name one cell in and one quality and i've written a little helper function here which uh, takes the name selling and quality and does what we saw in the previous test, effectively, um, and returns an item for us to write out. So that's our approval test. And with a, obviously a spoiler of the comment there, let's run that and see what happens. So um, the coverage tool warned us that um, because the test failed, we may not have got full output. But I know that the reason it failed was after this had executed. And so what we see here is we've got nine lines of output, and that's for the nine. Um, let me turn off line wrapping. Uh, the nine lots of input, so three times one times three values. An approval test has written out the input and then it's written out a text representation of the resultant item after we'd called update quality. And um, uh, so referring back to the questions earlier, this happens to be, uh, this works because there's an output stream operator provided for the an item object. So by definition, uh, we like this result because it's legacy code. We're, we're just capturing the behavior. I'm going to start using keyboard shortcuts at this point, Command S and Command Q to save the difference. And now we'll run it and the test passes. Um, OK, I should have run it with the coverage tool. I'm finding on my Mac with the coverage tools when they're set up properly. If I accidentally run it without coverage, I get really annoying messages about um, kind of corrupt files and things like that. And then I end up having to delete the files and, and rerun them. But you can see the output has changed. And um, every line is green now. So we might think, hooray, our job is done. But actually, Maybe not, because there are many if conditions here where there's no else. And so we don't know whether the not condition has been tested, whether we've got coverage for that. And so here I'm doing what's called line coverage. Has a line been covered or not? But there's a more sophisticated form of coverage called branch or condition coverage, which unfortunately C-Lion as of 2020.2 doesn't support um but that's okay um the code coverage.cmake file allows us to do that in a in a different way and i'm going to show you output from running it earlier uh, in the interest of time so the output is written to an html file which i'm going to open in the browser and we're going to browse down to gilded rose lib and then the cc file and as before we're seeing that the line coverage was 100 percent, and 100 percent of the functions were covered as well but here we can see for individual conditions which conditions were not covered so um we uh we have examples where the quality is less than 50 but we don't have examples where the quality is greater than or equal to 50. And if you decide you care about this sort of thing, you can very quickly look down and see, OK, mate, you can reason about, well, do I want to add in a cell in of 10 or 11 or 12? Or you can just say, I'll add um, 10, 11 and 12. I'll add 49, 50 and 51. Just it's really easy to cover the boundary cases. And also just to show you when there are multiple conditions on a line, this LCOV coverage report also shows 
that for the first condition it was covered with both true and false and the second condition it was covered with both true and false so really powerful and I have code that I can activate which is essentially the same test as before but with one extra string value two extra cell in values and two extra qualities values and if I run that our test will fail but look at how many cases we get so we've got 60 cases now and if you think about the original assertions that's 60 times 3 that's effectively 180 assertions and if our code breaks in future so I'll, I'll accept that it's the current behavior if our code were to change in future, say somebody broke the handling of the backstage passes uh, code, we would see when we got a failing test, it was only the backstage passes that failed and not any of the others. That would immediately help us narrow down and identify the area to look at. Maybe it's an improvement, maybe it's a breakage. So I hope that gives you a sense of the power of verify all combinations. I'm going to turn off code coverage here uh, and CMake will run and then um, I have um, got a script because I got so fed up with seeing those error messages from code coverage. Um, I wrote a script uh, some time ago that deletes the code coverage uh, output files. Uh, to um, not uh, get those under our feet of um, later tests. So that is looking at code coverage with the Gilded Rose Carter. So <clears throat> reminder that um, it's only when you work on an area of legacy code that you want to start looking at um, refactoring, looking at, well, checking the tests and if you need to refactor in order to add tests. Um, you want to understand how good the coverage is. If you need to improve the coverage and the functions that you're testing have got multiple inputs, then verify com all combinations is really powerful for that. It's also powerful if you're testing new code that's got large numbers of inputs. Uh, and uh, yeah, so quick summary. Um, oh, okay, actually, so I uh, mentioned you've seen individual lines now in the uh, approved file for that example. And I mentioned that verify all combinations writes one set of input values out um, and then the object is written out as well, if you like. It's a very loose way of saying it. But uh, And for a long time, the only way that we supported that in approval tests was by getting you to convert the object to a string yourself, perhaps via a helper function, or to provide um, what was mentioned in a question earlier, a custom output stream operator. Uh, and those are still, I'm sure, the most common ways of using it. But you can also use other loads of verify. So, for example, um, you can pass in a lambda that takes the O stream, takes an O stream, and um, you write the object to that. Um, you can, if you want to customize for particular classes, particular types of data without providing an operator, then you can specialize approval test string maker to string, which is an idea we cribbed from catch2 or behind approvals is a template class T appro approvals and you can provide your own string converting class. So say you want to run this on an embedded system and there's no streams, you can, you can provide your own class to do that conversion. Uh, more recently, we had a wonderful contribution to add support to the format library. So if you are using the format library and you're writing out containers, maps, tuples, things like that, if you call FMT approvals verify, then um, you, take, you can take advantage of all of the powerful formatting and functionality in the FMT library. I want to touch briefly on what you write though. So this is the mechanics of how you write your object out, your data out. But what about 
how you lay the information out. I think the number one thing I want to say is only print out relevant data. Uh, so if you've got, we could perhaps have um, only written out the sell-in and the value in the previous case and not the name because the name didn't change. Oh, it's harmless to include it as well. Um, you need the data to be consistent between runs, although my next example will talk about how to manage that if, if it isn't consistent. And you want to make it so that it's readable, it's easy to read. So on the right-hand side, if we've got a test failure, this kind of layout, all of the numbers, all of the interesting stuff is grouped together, which makes a test failure much easier to understand than when it's spread out on the left-hand side. Um, we have advice, uh, tips, um, with lots more examples of how to do this kind of formatting. Any questions at this point? So, again, we have a bunch of questions. Question one. Um, it's mentioned approval tests could be used in some specific scenarios like file. What are the other test scenarios that could be used? Like file? So all of approval tests results, the expected output is saved in files. So it definitely needs a file system to run. I suspect I'm not asking that question. Klaus, can you clarify it at all? Of course, it's, it's also difficult for me, but I think this was the question. So you say we always need a file. I think this answers the question yeah. from my perspective. Okay, then Roy had a very good question that you will love to answer. Sometimes the output of legacy code is somewhat dependent on some random seat or on the current date time. Do you have mm -hmm. recommendations or ways to deal with such cases? Yeah, spoiler, we have recently yes. added a mechanism called Scrubber that enables you to uh, get that under control. And uh, I think the next demo covers that. Well, one of the next two demos covers that. Okay. And last question, does that mean approval tests help in improving code courage by going through all branches? Um, uh, so, yes, I kind of, so I, I want to make sure I haven't oversold it. You can use a code coverage tool that checks branch coverage to find out what conditions are not tested. And then if you want to improve the coverage, then using um, verify all, or if there's only one input or verify all combinations, if there's two or more inputs enables you to quickly add tests for lots more paths through the code. It can't tell you what values to add. You still need to look at the code and reason about the code. Um, there was a talk at a meeting C++ in Germany last year. Uh, Tina Ulbrick and a colleague of hers talked about mm -hmm. using approval tests in combination with... Um, fuzz testing to identify cases um, where uh, particular input values that were not covered. So that's a really good talk to look at as well, if the video is available for that. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let's look at non-deterministic output then. And demo three. So let's get rid of all of these, switch to demo three. So again, this is a somewhat contrived example, but what we're asked to do is to write a test for uh, some operation that the only access we have to, to it is the, the log from it. So if I run this test and we see what the output is, you can see it's writing out doing step one, doing step two, doing step three, and so on. And yeah, maybe the code that you're testing has a log file already. Um, maybe you could capture that log file, even if it's only for an hour or two, to start doing some refactoring. And then once you don't need to, you know, then you've, you've got more fine grained testing later on. Um, but uh, whatever refactoring I'm going to do, I want to make sure that I'm not missing out a step, doing steps in the wrong order, maybe by mistake calling a step multiple times when it was only run once before. So I want to use this text 
to lock this down, I want to capture its behaviour in a file in preparation for refactoring. So how can we do that? Well, this doesn't really lend itself to calling a verify method. There isn't a thing that we can pass in. But if I look at do stuff, at least it's written in terms of a base class, an output stream, um, rather than um, specifically um, this outputs, you know, standard C out, standard output. So we could imagine that we could um, pass a stream in instead, and we would want that to be an output file stream. So we'll create, I'm sort of working backwards from what I want and filling in the gaps. So we're going to create a output file stream. And obviously we're going to want a file name for that. So we could think of sensible file names and worry about directories and things like that. But the lovely thing is that approval tests has capability for all of that already. So I'm going to say approvals get default namer. And we can ask the, the namer, what are you going to call the received file for this test? What are you going to call the approved file? So I'm going to say, what's the received file going to be called? And it's extension with dot. So I'll say we'll call it a log file. So now if I run that, so let's use this wonderful select open file to navigate. OK, so we don't have any output files yet. If I run the test, well, that's interesting. So it's created an approval test directory. So let me show you why that is. Uh, very often you might find when you add more and more CPP files and more and more approval files that uh, the tests that use approval tests that these clutter up the source code. And if you want, you can use a line like this, typically in your main, so it applies to all of your tests in that pro test program. And you can say, put the approval file, approved files in a subdirectory called approval tests. An important aspect of this that I'm not going to explain, but just point out at the moment, is that uh, you need to hang on to the return type, the return object. Um, when that goes out of scope, it reverses that customization. So that's why the uh, file has been written, the received file has been written to approval tests, and there is its content. OK, so we're saving it, but we're not testing it. So how do we start testing it? Well, we have um, approvals. Uh, we've got verify existing file. So if we pass in the file name, uh, we uh, that should work. So let's see what happens. So now we're instead of saying verify this object and write it out, we're saying to approval test, we've created that file already. Um, approve it. So our test fails. We can approve the output, save and quit. And so as always, we rerun the test. And of course, it's not passing because we have got the um, date object in it. So what can we do about this? So the conventional answer to this would be to modify our code so that we can pass in um, to uh, do stuff or somewhere pass through the code because we don't want to change the interface into do stuff something, some customization point and say, here is an object that returns a fixed date and time when we're running in the test. Uh, that can be really quite hard to do and it's not the sort of thing you want to do without tests. And so approval tests has a mechanism called scrubber. I'm not sure that I necessarily would have chosen this word, but uh, approvals is implemented for a dozen or more different languages and the vocabulary is consistent between all of the languages. And Scrubber was the concept in other implementations and so we use the same in, um, in the C++ implementation. And so I'm going to talk you through um, creating a Scrubber. So one way to create a Scrubber is to have a regular expression. 
Uh, I'm not sure what that's going to look like for now. Um, but we're going to say for matches of a particular re expression, replace it with some fixed text. So I might say date and time or date and time stamp or something like that. Something that when someone sees the output, they will see that, um, see what was there originally and they'll understand it. OK, um, uh, it's fun that I'm doing this at the top of the hour, which is going to make this a bit more um, slightly more complicated for reasons that will become clear. So I'm going to use a technique called fake it till we make it. So I'm going to say that's my regular expression, which obviously is going to fail because already time has passed and very soon we're going to go on to, I'm in UK time, so um, <clears throat> on to 7pm UK time. But let's start with that for now. So we want to take a, create a scrubber. So we're going to say auto scrubber equals and then we've got this namespace scrubbers and we can say create regex scrubber and we pass in the date regular expression and we pass in the replacement text and then to use that we create an options object and this is a relatively recent addition to approval tests. We used to have lots of different overloads depending on what you wanted to customise and we collapsed all of those down to options and a lot of the behaviour you can customise by um, passing in by, by passing in an options object uh, with um, one or more things customised. It's a fluent interface. So I can either pass in the scrubber there, or if I already had a, uh, an options in which I'd customise the reporter say, then I can say with scrubber and pass in the scrubber. So as we're close to top of the hour, I'm going to say match any digit for the seconds any digit for the uh, minutes and any digit for the hours. Uh, whoops, backslash D, backslash D. Okay, so what I expect to happen is that those digits in the output will be replaced by this date and time stamp. And it didn't get replaced. And it's not because it tripped over the hour. So what's happening here is the here we create a stream and we write the file. We we write uh, we we call we write our logging to that stream. But I haven't closed that stream object yet. That stream is open. So that file is locked. And so approval test then can't overwrite the, the output. And so I can either call uh, stream.close or I can um, create a scope so that when the stream goes out of scope, um, it gets closed and its buffer gets flushed. Uh, and what? There was a couple of error messages. There was, yes. Um, let's, um, let's go to view. I closed most of the messages. OK. Well, I've closed the diffing tool now. So the only time this has failed for me before is when I hadn't um, got that expression right. So of course I'm not sure. It appeared that there is some unknown symbol. Perhaps this was a compilation error. It was very very quick. Can only really see briefly. Okay. But... So let yeah, good point. So let's say build O3 log files. So that built, but it did flash by really quickly, didn't it? <coughs> OK, so I think what I'm going to do at this point, um, let's OK, let's delete both of these files and see if I'm able to do those. OK, 
Okay, that's good. So let's run it again and then we'll see if it can recreate the files. It hasn't got an approved file. Okay, this is unfortunate, but I'm not going to spend time Okay, working so on it when now. user is suggesting escaping in the red rec extreme of course of course thank you very much thank you okay let's quit the diffing tool thank you so much okay so now we see the date and time has been replaced thank you to whoever said that um and so now we run it again and it passes and so uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to take you through replacing um, all of the other bits of the string. Of course, you would generalize it. But this is what the fully generalized regular expression would look like um, in the readme for this example. And you'll have a link at the end to all of this code. OK. So verify existing file is useful for when you're code that you're testing is already writing out one or more files, perhaps with complex output in, perhaps over multiple write calls. And um, you want to verify the contents, preserve that uh, output and use it to detect any changes in future behavior. Scrubbers are useful for any kind of non-deterministic output. So someone mentioned a random seed earlier and the conventional wisdom for that is to create a seam create a way to pass in perhaps the seed for your random um, <clears throat> function, though the seeds, they tend not to be consistent across platforms. Another is if it's saved in a way that you can recognize a pattern, you can use a scrubber to identify the, the values that are random and changing and convert them to some kind of placeholder text. And we're coming up with more scrubbers soon. So, any questions on that? So, we have one question. Um, will the demo code be available too? Yes, it will. I will try and remember to show you towards the end how to find, navigate through the links to find the dev demo code and a bunch of other stuff as well. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. So, let's talk a little. Oh, sorry. Go on. Uh, let's talk a bit about customizability. Um, so here I'm going for awareness rather than detail. So when you call approvals verify or any of the similar functions, um, the, and you've now seen that a scrubber can be used to modify the content. You also saw me using a namer to get the name of the received file. Um, then uh, a writer is used to write the object out to disk. And then a comparator is called to check, to compare the receive, the contents of the received file against the contents of the approved file, uh, ignoring line ending differences. And if they are the same, the test passes. If not, the test fails and a reporter pops up. And all of those things in blue are customizable. At this point, I just briefly want to mention the documentation and say that we, we take huge pride in the documentation. Um, we really, yeah, we're putting all this time into writing this library. Um, we figure that people won't use it if we don't explain how to use it. Um, although my speaking career did get going, my C++ speaking career did get going when we didn't have any documentation and I gave a talk at C++ on C last year to plug it, but um, the docs is a more scalable way of doing that. Significantly, all of the example code in our documentation is generated from compiled and tested code. And any output files like this is what your approved file would look like, they all come directly from our um, tested code as well. You can see the documentation either on our GitHub site or more recently, uh, we added support for read the docs. I, I prefer the formatting in read the docs. It's got a really nice search capability. Um, we run a few of our key classes through Doxygen to show the API, and you can download a PDF and read that offline as well. But these are the links on the front page of our documentation, so you can find out how to use the customizations. Any questions on customizations? No, not yet. 
OK, thanks. So on to my last example, um, which I'll go through quickly. I'm going to talk now about visualising differences. So show, so far we've seen text files and um, differences have been quite easy to understand. OK, so demo for SVG files. So this test fails. How big is the difference in the image? So SVG is an image file format and it's a text text file. So we had a test already and something has happened. Something has caused the test to start failing. Wow, OK. So it's only one line is different. Um, we see line 98, but it's quite a long line. And if I scroll down, OK, so the difference is there. So a few decimal places in the right at the very end of this file. And so the question is, does that matter or not? So I'm not going to approve that change right now because I don't know. But what would be really nice is SVG as a graphics file format. Why can't I just see the difference? And I've written a custom reporter implementation. So let's use that. So we're going to, um, I called my new, I'll talk through the code. I want to show it in action first, and then I'll talk through the code and show it. Show you how it works. So we've got a SVG reporter. So I'll create an instance of SVG reporter and pass it into an option. So let's run that and see what happens. So a couple of in, Inkscape windows flashed up and then disappeared. Uh, approval, uh, Araxis Merge is running as before. So uh, if you want to see the difference in the text, but also Beyond Compare has popped up. Now, both Beyond Compare and Araxis Merge are their commercial tools. We support many free diffing tools as well, but I do a lot of diffing with all the work on legacy code and on approval tests, and I've chosen to spend to buy licenses to both these tools. They're not very expensive. What I really like about Beyond Compare for images is you see the uh, file one and file two. So on the left, of course, we've got the received, on the right, the approved. But then it shows you the differences as well. And beautifully, you can zoom in and get close-ups. If we do that, hopefully on the resolution of the screen, you can see that we've got some red here. So a few values are different. And um, so the alpha value is different there. Um, if you look at the bottom left hand corner, uh, one pixel has a transparency 117, the other one 150. Uh, there's a couple of other pixels different here, but you may not may not be able to see that on the stream. So that tells us where the difference is. Uh, then you need to have a conversation to work out if that difference matters or not. But that means you can go to your product owner or however your team is structured and say, that change you asked me to make, I did what you asked, but it had this unexpected consequence. Do you care? Do you want me to spend more time on it? Or are you happy with the change? Um, and depending on what the answer is, um, that tells you whether to revert the change or uh, to approve the um uh, prove the changed output there. And I just wanted to show you that in this directory, I've got a git ignore that I've said ignore all PNG files. So the PNG values, PNG files have no value to us in our version control system because they're machine generated from text files that are version controlled. So any time we want to look at um, failing test, we can just regenerate the PNG files, which is really nice. Uh, so that was a very specific example to images. But the more general point here is that custom report. Oh, I didn't show you the code. Let me show you the implementation of that. So if we go to SVG reporter, it implements approval tests reporter class and the reporter uh, abstract base class has uh, requires a single method report that takes the name of a received file and the name of an approved file. And so that's what we've got here. And if I go to the implementation, 
Uh, I am taking the SVG files, file names, and passing them to a function to convert them to PNG. And that function returns the name of the output PNG file, which is a really nice pattern for convenience for testing. So we've got the two files converted to PNG. And because I like Beyond Compare as a, a diff tool for images, I'm specifically saying create an instance of the Beyond Compare reporter um, and ask it to report on the differences between the received PNG and the approved as PNG. And then afterwards, I call the default reporter, create an instance of the default reporter and uh, get it to report the differences on the SVG files. So hopefully that gives you a flavor of how you can write your own custom reporter. You can add support for diffing tools that we don't support. Um, but think about realize any failures. Perhaps if it's numeric data, write out a chart as well, to compare the differences and only version control stuff that is actually used, uh, needed to make the test pass or fail. Since I mentioned images, I'd like to point out this image approvals library, um, which is built on top of approval tests for C++, but it understands meaningful differences. It understands the two images. It, it doesn't treat the image files as, as binary blobs, which the main approval test library does. It reads the image files and does pixel comparisons. So here we've got two Mandelbrot images created on different um, different graphics boards. And I don't know if the little green dots around the edge are going to show up on the stream, but um, these just give GPUs just give different results. And you can decide how much tolerance to allow for your test to pass. It is under development, uh, but I would recommend following it because it looks like it's going to be a really useful library. So any questions on that last demo? So there's three. Okay. First question, um, as you said, it's header only. Does that mean that there is no library need to be included with our build system? That's right, yes, yeah. Um, you, you can either clone or fork our or download our library and build against the separate individual headers and CPP files, or you can download all of that code collapsed into one file as part of our release process, which is the simplest way to get started. All right, then um, is there any C++ compiler dependency? So um, is cross-platform compilation possible? Uh, so that's um, so the dependency is the library itself uses C++ 11 features. Um, if and we we tend to not keep up with compiler versions because we want it to be easy to be to use with legacy code. If anyone came along and said they'd got a lot of C++ 98 code that they or 2003 or whatever, uh, and they wanted it to support that, then come and talk to us and, and we'll work something out to do that. But we haven't yet been asked. Um, at the moment, though, it doesn't really play nicely with cross compilation because it's very dependent on the names of the source files that are in, uh, embedded in the compiled code. But we do have a pull request, which is about the next thing that we're going to pick up. Um, that uh, that will uh, specifically to enable it to run under cross compilation environment. So I'd say check back in, I don't know, a couple of weeks, uh, month at the outside, and we should have support for that. Uh, and and have a look. It's our one. We've got an issue and a pull request. If you want to follow that issue in GitHub and then try it out and give us feedback, we'd really appreciate that. Yeah. All right. Okay, and then there's a question that you might already have answered. Um, I, I read it anyway, perhaps there's uh, an additional detail. So floating point values sometimes differ slightly based on numeric stability differences between compilers, optimization flags, etc. Does the package support comparing floating point numbers? Uh, does the package support comparing floating point values up to some threshold? 
No, it doesn't. And the only thing that I can think of with that would be to add a scrubber that reads all of the values and rounds them, perhaps say rewrites them having dropped to decimal places of precision or something like that. And hopefully that gets you away from any uh, boundaries, but I'm not, I'm not sure it would in all cases. So we don't have a good story on that point. Okay, thank you. But it's a good question. Okay. So on to my summary then. So as a reminder, approval tests uh, you've now seen allows you to verify a chunk of output, such as an object or a file in a single operation, as opposed to writing many test assertions for each element. Uh, easy to use, very convenient, it, many, many. It, it uses a, uh, a philosophy called um, convention over configuration so you can customize it but by convention it just works out of the box so you don't have to its default behavior is sensible with no configuration from the developer and it's if you look at the library it's a pretty small bunch of code i mean we've got a lot of tests um, but for its size it's amazingly powerful and flexible and so a lot of the value in talking about it's trying to convey to people the different scenarios it can help out with um, if you want to know more, I found out today that my talk proposal for CPPCon has been accepted. And there I'm specifically talking about testing QT desktop applications with approval tests. Um, I spoke about that at meeting C++ last year, but unfortunately there was a problem with the recording. So uh, this will be an update and an enhancement of that. Um, it will talk about testing GUIs in general, not just Qt the, or Qt, but the examples will be using Qt. Um, and then also following a successful workshop at C++ on C, Llewellyn and I, again, Llewellyn's the creator of approval tests. In September, we're running a workshop spread over four days, two hours a day. So we found that um, six or eight hours on one day was just too much. People were exhausted at the end. So We've got four days, two hours, um, Tuesday. One of those overlaps with CPPCon for a couple of hours, um, but they are making their videos available to watch out of, out of sync if you're not in the right time zone, for example, to watch a talk live. So you, you won't, um, you should have, if it overlaps with any talks you want to go to, you should have an opportunity to ask questions at another point and see the video. Uh, if you, oh, there's also an option if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one consultation with Llewellyn and I looking at your code. Uh, if you want to know more, the link is um, bit.ly legacy CPP set 2020. So that is what I have to tell you about quickly and effectively testing legacy C++ code with approval tests. Thanks very much. Thank you, Claire. Uh, so we have two more questions, and then I suggest we uh, just shift all the other questions to our after talk chat. Okay, I've got one or two more slides with references, and then space okay. for questions at the end. So, right. Perfect. Um, so all of the links from this talk are from this repo, and I'm going to just open that up and show you how to find what you want. So this talk was so if you save only one URL, you probably want to save this link and. Um, Hopefully someone can put it in the chat or I'll tweet it later as well. Um, so this was quickly and effectively testing legacy C++ code with approval tests. So here we have the link to the code and I will add. So this was the, the four demos that I went through were all in here. And I'll add a new bullet point here with the version of the code as of today. Uh, I'll do that um, probably t uh, tonight or tomorrow morning. That's the link to the training session I mentioned. These are the links to our repos. So we've got the main project and the starter project and tiny, tiny initial experiments at testing QT widgets with approval tests. These are the two documentation links I mentioned. There are various links to specific documentation pages throughout, and those are there throughout the talk. You can see all of my talks um, 
from that link, how to set up code coverage on Mac and Windows explains what I did on Mac. Lots more about the Gilded Rose Carter and then some other useful links that I haven't mentioned. This video in particular is fantastic on how to refactor code that you don't understand and it's really complicated cluttered code. Okay. Um, so that's it. Last question slot. <laughs> All right. Um, so you mentioned C++ legacy, C++ legacy code, but in any feature, this uh, could be used with legacy C code as well. I think no. We need a C++ compiler. Um, I'm pretty sure of that. Okay. I don't know if it's possible to write thin wrappers around it. Um, I think all of our tests, all the test frameworks we support are fundamentally C++ test frameworks. Um, mm -hmm. It Which doesn't, mm -hmm. okay. very small volume of code though. I can imagine that if someone really wanted to port it to C or wanted to pay someone to port it to C, it would be eminently doable. All right, and the last question, um, are there other similar approval test frameworks in other languages? Yes. Um, let me go back to Safari. So if I go to our code, so uh, so this is approvaltest.com, uh, which links to the GitHub. I follow this other link first of all. So from the GitHub repo, you can go up to the user approvals and you can see all of the different repos. There's uh, 44 different repositories there. So there's that as a possibility uh, for to actually find the code, or here's a quick summary of the languages that were considered well enough supported that the people um, Llewellyn actually put links in. Um, I only have experience of the Python one, but I know that Java and C Sharp are really well used. Uh, I have no reason to doubt any of the others. All right, thank you very much. Consider there's a loud applause, people standing up, <laughs> standing ovations. Um, <laughs> this is the disadvantage of these uh, online talks. Yeah, consider yes. yourself um, to be the center of uh, attention. Now, there's a lot of people that say um, thanks, great talk, um, clapping, etc. Um, so, I hope you see a lot of these in the after talk chat as well. So, thanks Thank from you. my side. Thanks a lot. Um, it was a great talk. Thank you. And thank you for the questions as well. It, giving talks like this is hard because you don't get the eye contact. You don't get people sort of raising an eyebrow if they didn't understand things and mm -hmm. so on. So actually getting questions and being able to ask those is really valuable. Thank you very much. And thank you to the person who pointed out the regular expression blooper as well. <laughs>